Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the latest Wanderlust event, uh, reader event. And we're going to be tonight hearing about and seeing images of Uganda. So very exciting. Really looking forward to this. In fact, if you've been to uh, Uganda yourself in the past, it'd be good to know. I've just been reminiscing with our speakers that uh, I was there myself something like 33 years ago, which uh, obviously I was very young, very young. But uh, a wonderful country. It certainly left an indelible impression. So do say hello. Welcome to Mary, for instance, from sunny Dublin. Oh, I'm glad you're uh, getting good weather like us, Mary. And uh, oh, Sally and Tony in sunny Simmons Yacht. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful part of the world and lovely to hear from you guys again. And uh, Vera in Belgium, we do like to cover the world here, like Nicola and Milton Keynes. Lots of people commenting on the sunshine. It seems to be sunny everywhere this evening. Elizabeth in sunny Hebden Bridge in West Yorkshire. So hello, everybody. Make yourself comfortable and uh, hope you're sitting comfortably. Got a drink to hand because we're going to have a fascinating hour or so tonight. Um, hello to Stuart from a cloudy, rainy Portland in Oregon. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's usually what we're saying about the uh, rain, of course, as British, but no. Hello, Victoria, the Isle of Wight, and Martin Symington, a, a wonderful contributor, and he's currently in Portugal. Uh, I've just missed somebody there saying that they are sitting in Uganda, so that's brilliant. Hello, Kate in Toronto. It's not snowing today. Yes, it can. There's been a lot of snow lately. Hello, Tony in the Quantock Hills of sunny Somerset. And... Uh, Linda's in Chippenham, Derek in London, Liz in the Cotswolds, Rosalind in Sunny Margate. Steve Hank says he's been to Uganda seven times. And uh, so, um, wonderful. The youth group is wonderful with some young people. Gosh, sounds, that sounds incredible. Hello, is that Martin uh, from Poland? Welcome. And um, Caroline, who said that... Uh, she had a fab holiday there in Uganda in 2020. And uh, hello, Barbara in Portugal, Vicky in Florida, and uh, Fiona, who says her son is living in Kampala. Hello to Scott in Interior, Alaska. Lots of snow there. <laughs> I bet there is at the moment. And um, Emma's in sunny Middlesex, Terence in Chicago. So from all over, and it's not very often you see the uh, word sunny Sheffield together, but uh, <laughs> it seems to be there. So hello, Ali. Thanks for joining us tonight. So uh, welcome, everybody. We will kick off in a moment. Uh, hello to Mary from San Diego, California. And um, Helen from Minchinhampton. Not quite sure where that is, but it sounds very intriguing. And uh, Cindy and Johannesburg. So, like I said, we are covering the world tonight. Uh, Sharon says she's been to Uganda and actually did the trek to see the gorillas. Brilliant. Yes, isn't it, Dust? And I'm sure we're going to be hearing about that tonight. Um, Peggy in Stornoway, Isle of Lewis. And uh, Maureen in Berkeley, California. Anxiously awaiting rain. Oh, gosh. We, we never have those words in this tree and uh, I'm sure we can send you some and uh, somebody uh, John is there about Uganda I'll come back and read that in a bit Sally who had a great trip to Uganda with the best bird guide and uh, talks about a group of ladybird guides called the ladybirds so I don't know if we're going to hear a bit about them tonight I'm going to ask about them and um, Diane uh, is uh, coming in from Uganda, so that's brilliant. Oh, Helen, thank you for filling me in for where for where Minchinhampton is. In Gloucestershire, I'm well enough to up the my road at this after this. So, hello everybody. So, yes, we uh, will be kicking off properly in a moment. So, uh, what we're going to do this evening is after the introductions, um, we've got a short presentation. Uh, from Andy is here tonight representing the Taurus board and we will then have our main speaker and um, that's Charlotte Beauvoir. Oh, you're a trip over that name. 
bow poison. And um, Charlotte is coming in live to us tonight from Uganda. So um, that's going to be brilliant to hear from her. And then we're hopefully going to have lots of time for the Q&A as well. So we don't have to take all your questions. And for that, we've been joined by Brett from Worldwide Worldwide. So um, just looking at a techie person issue here. Nikki said she can't see the videos. Um, do try reconnecting again, Vicky, because it does seem to be running smoothly at this end. Um, just to remind people, though, that as ever, we will be recording this evening's presentation and we'll be sharing the link for that in the next few days. So if for any reason you do have technical problems or if you do need to leave early, don't worry, because we will be sharing the recording and also any of the useful information that comes up, um, any place names you want to know about, any uh, useful websites, we will share that, as I say, within the next few days. So, uh, Uganda, and um, I, I mean, certainly I know from my memories of it that I remember it being one of the smallest countries in Africa, and yet it's got this incredible natural diversity. Of course, we best know it perhaps um, in the West for mountain gorillas and, and chimpanzees and little primates. And uh, I know it's a bit of a bird watcher's mecca as well. It's got something like over a thousand birds. And some people say it's got the largest number of species in Africa. It's, of course, it's got adventure too. It's got incredible white water rafting. It's got trekking. Uh, but it's not just the nature. And I must admit that when I ever I think about Uganda, I think about the people. And uh, there's something like 45 ethnic groups, I believe. And... Um, of course, Uganda's got a reputation for being perhaps the friendliest country in Africa. So, so much to see and do there. And no wonder it's called the Pearl of Africa. So, um, as I say, we are going to kick off in a moment. But just to run through who our speakers are tonight, we're joined by Andy Price. And Andy heads up the UK office of the Uganda Tourism Board. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Hi, Andy. Thank you for joining us this evening. Indeed, You're for welcome. setting up this event. Uh, we're so delighted to be uh, doing this uh, with the Taurus Board tonight. So, yes, Andy said he loves Uganda for its diversity of wildlife, fauna, terrain, but especially its people. So, yes, <laughs> uh, really mirroring what uh, my impressions were as well. And so Andy um, is very much a global traveller and particularly passionate about the positive impact that tourism can have on destinations and their communities, helping them to maintain their unique heritage and cultures. So yes, absolutely, I agree. Then we're also joined by Brett Charman. Hi, Brett. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Hi everyone. Yeah. So um, Brett's a multiple award-winning wildlife photographer and tour leader for Wildlife Worldwide. And Brett left his studies in architecture to pursue a career in the safari industry and actually managed a remote bush camp in Zambia's South Luangwa National Park. Since then, Brett's travelled far and wide across Africa, searching for the best wildlife. And that includes a two week self drive across Uganda in an old land cruiser. And he does say that coming face to face with the mountain gorillas of windy and penetrable forest ranks among his top wildlife encounters. Yes, I agree with you there, Brett. Uh, absolutely brilliant. And then we're also joined tonight by Charlotte. Um, now, I'm hoping Charlotte was on here earlier and we seem to have lost her. Charlotte, can you hear us? Okay. Well, hopefully, um, Charlotte will be popping back up to join us in a few moments. I presume, as I say, she is out there in Uganda, so I presume she might have a slight technical issue at the moment but um, Charlotte first touched down in Uganda as a VSO volunteer with the Uganda Conservation Foundation and she found she just couldn't bear to leave and her award-winning blog Diary of Mzungu documents her 10 plus years living in East Africa and I really recommend the blog it I've been dipping in and out of it and uh, over the last month and it's absolutely fascinating so Charlotte's a contributor to the Brat Uganda Guidebook, 
and she writes for Fodors and Horizon Guides from her wooden house at Sunbird Hill on the edge of the Bali National Park in Western Uganda. So, as I say, um, Charlotte should hopefully be coming back on soon. Um, as I say, we're hoping it's, that's just a temporary technical issue. So, um, I think what we'll probably best thing to do now then is um, we will go to a short video just to get us in the mood on Uganda. Every waking day is a reminder just how beautiful this, our land truly is. Every waking day is a reminder just how beautiful this, our land, truly is. The kind of beauty that you can only find here. In the lush green all around us and the wondrous sights within. It's what you feel in the gentle caress of tropical wind from the mountaintops. And the glow in your heart from a warm neighborly invite. It's in the distinct aroma of our cooking to the taste of food that takes you on a journey. In the sound of homecoming and the sound of Mother Earth. In the magnificence we find on our travels and the exciting moments we experience. Ours is the kind of beauty that comes in all things big and small. All we have to do is awaken our senses and truly enjoy what's uniquely ours. Oh, right. Well, sorry that there was a slight technical hitch there with that video at first, and uh, we're not quite sure what happened there. Very unusual. But um, at least that was working then, so I hope that didn't spoil your enjoyment of it, and it did give us a bit of a flavour. So, Andy, welcome back, and I think you're going to give us a little bit of an overview about Uganda. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Uh, firstly, um, thank you to everybody for, for joining this evening. Uh, a big thank you to, to Wanderlust for putting on. They've been a brilliant partner for, with the Uganda Tourist Board. Thank you to Brett and Charlotte. And of course, thank you uh, to all of you uh, for joining this evening. Um, as you'll see throughout the evening, Uganda is a place where you can find all of Africa in one place, where you can discover not just the big five, but the big seven. Um, you can find the source of the River Nile. Um, beautiful landscapes, amazingly friendly people, and you can discover their cultures uh, and traditions. And that's really a big part of uh, immersing yourself in, in Uganda. Um, I'll just correct Lynn slightly. Sorry, Lynn. There's actually 56 tribes um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Uganda. So um, that's a major part of visiting, visiting their, their cultures. And they are, like Lynn said, so, so friendly people. 
uh, they really want to, to show off uh, everything. Uh, they're so proud of their country. Um, as Winston Churchill himself said, um, the great man said, for magnificence, for variety of form and colour, for profusion of brilliant life, bird, insect, reptile and beast, for vast scale, Uganda truly is the pearl of Africa. And um, we're very, very proud of uh, our destination. Uh, I was trying to uh, do that off um, off the off pat then, but uh, I've had to, to read the last bit. But um, uh, Uganda itself is a beautiful country. Obviously, as you can see uh, on the map, um, Lake Victoria down in the south, uh, Congo, South Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania and Rwanda are our bordering uh, neighbours. Um, we are made up of 10 uh, beautiful national parks and 13 uh, game reserves, uh, which are spread all over uh, all over the um, uh, the country. Um, we're surrounded by uh, everything from, as you saw in the video, the, the Rerenzori Mountains. So we have snow-capped mountains. We have lots of activities on the water, um, beautiful forests, uh, great safari plains as well. So when you're exploring Uganda, it really is a, a diverse um, destination. Uh, and as we say, you can find all of Africa uh, in one place. Um, I hope you get a lot out of this evening. You know, please ask us lots of different questions. Um, we've got some fantastic experts here. Uh, and one other thing that I'd really love you to, um, to, to do, if you haven't done already, uh, we've partnered with Wanderlust on a, on a fantastic campaign and they've been brilliant. Um, and on their website is, a, is an immersive Uganda experience. Uh, so you can go on and, and discover all about the bird life, uh, but with birds in the background. And the, you can hear the, the gorillas and you can hear the, uh, the dancing and the songs of the people. So um, after this evening or, or when you want to, um, to find out more, please go on to, to the Wanderlust immersive experience. We hope tonight inspires you to put Uganda on the, the Wanderlust bucket list and um, you explore in person yourself. So um, look forward to questions uh, later uh, and then I'll hand you over to um, the, uh, the absolute experts. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And uh, yes, yeah, very short. And I trust you to pull me up. Yes, um, on a number of ethnic groups. Uh, I never was any good at numbers, but um, it just you know brought it over, didn't it? Just how many there are. And I uh, think I know for me, and I, and I do say this is a uh, somebody who loves wildlife and nature. But for me, Uganda, I think all those years ago was very much about the people. Absolutely, absolutely. It really is. Uh, such an important part of um, uh, of visiting. Uh, obviously, the wildlife and what you see around you, the natural beauty is, is wonderful. But actually, you know, the people that genuinely are the f some of the friendliest I've ever met anywhere in the world. So, um, yeah, it's a big part of visiting. Yeah, well, I'm sure we're going to get lots and lots of questions. But just one very quickly, just a really basic one. I mean, the world is opening up again to tourism. Can we fly to Uganda? Uh, we can fly to Uganda uh, again now. Um, at the moment, uh, you would have to still fly in via one of the other um, hubs, uh, i.e. via Kenya or Ethiopian uh, from, from the UK. Obviously, we've got guests from all over the world now, so you um, find different uh, routes in. It's, it's really easy to get to. Uh, at the moment, uh, everything's open. Still need to do a, a PCR test uh, within 72 hours. But the government are looking at, uh, at changing that um, very, very soon. Uh, Uganda Airlines, the new Uganda Airlines, have announced non-stop service from the UK uh, as well. So that'll be really exciting soon. Uh, we haven't got an exact date uh, on the start yet, but soon Uganda Airlines will be able to take you directly from uh, London down to uh, down to Entebbe, uh, just on the outskirts of Kampala. So it'll be even easier. So. Uh, the answer to that question, Lynn, is absolutely. We are waiting. We've been closed like the rest of the world for, for two sad years. Uh, and we are we, we can't wait to, to welcome guests uh, back straight away. Yeah, OK. Well, that's all brilliant. Great news. Thank you, Andy. And we'll see you You're welcome. soon for the Q&A. We'll see you later. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so now I'd like to uh, welcome Charlotte. 
die of the Mazungo Charlotte. Hey, there she is. Hooray! <laughs> Great to see you, Charlotte. And uh, Hi, it's Lynn. so exciting to have you on here tonight. And uh, tell us exactly where you're sitting. Well, it's interesting. I've ended up at a place called Cheninga Lodge, which is the featured image that you have on your page where everyone registers. And it's a big coincidence. Um, I just happened to be coming here to meet the lodge manager um, about some uh, a marathon and some fundraising events that he's doing and decided to stay overnight. So here I am in the dining room of the fabulous Cheninga Lodge near a place called Fort Portal in Western Uganda. Um, and as you, you can see a bit behind me, the whole thing is is made of wood. It's hand carved. It's like something out of a James Bond film. It's a staggeringly beautiful lodge. Um, and I will send you a link to its website tomorrow in, in our follow up email. Oh, dude, that would be great to have that in there. Um, OK, brilliant. Well, I'm going to leave you to it. So, Charlotte, take it away. Thank you very much, Lynn. Thank you so much for inviting me to tell you all about my favourite subject, which is Uganda. Um, yes, my name is Charlotte Beauvoisin, and locally I'm called Nagawa, which means I'm the protector of Enchima, the red-tailed monkey. And Uganda has some very interesting uh, conservation messages through these totems, and some of them are these lovely monkeys, but you could also equally be a, a mushroom or a lion or um, any other kind of living thing. Um, not all tribes have the totem system. This is this belongs to the tribe, the uh, the Baganda tribe, who live in Buganda, which is the central region of Uganda. Um, and I have a lot of fun with my Chiganda name, as we call it. Um, so, and I'm, I'm a blogger. I've been living in Uganda since 2009. I came here as a VSO volunteer, and it was an amazing, life-changing experience. And in fact, Uganda. I honestly, as soon as I got here, as soon as I arrived in its heavy airport, I never wanted to leave. And that was that was nearly 13 years ago. Um, and the rest is history, as they say. And, and I started blogging just for fun. And it's become a really interesting lifestyle. And I now work permanently in tourism. So let me just give you a snapshot of a few of my favorite things in Uganda. Um, as I say, I've been here uh, a long time, maybe 13 years, initially as a conservation volunteer. Um, so this is a, a, a snapshot of our dear country, my, my adopted country. As you can hear, I'm British by birth um, and I've, I've covered most of the country by now. But when I first arrived here, I, I did a number of things, um, but I didn't want to rush to see the whole country because I thought this country is so small, you know, it's the size of the UK. I don't want to do everything too quickly, but actually it's really developed a lot in this, in these last, in this last decade. And we've got more and more lodges, uh, more activities. And even the lodges that I visited 10 years ago have, have developed and refurbished and added new aspects. So for example, this lodge here now has a spa that, that, that they didn't have two years ago. So if I just take you um, uh, a, a little bit through my Uganda, some of my favourite places, and this is a this is a tourist map of the country, and unfortunately I can't zoom in um, and show it to you in detail. Um, but at the bottom we have Lake Victoria, the world's uh, second biz biggest freshwater lake, and we don't have a lot of activities on there. We do have a sailing club. Um, and of course, fishing is an activity there, but most of the um, and, and interesting of the country is is a quarter of water. We have the lake, uh, we have uh, the River Nile, of course, and we have dozens of crater lakes. Uh, Cheninga Lodge, where I am, overlooks a, a crater lake. Um, and the main tourist areas are from here. So here we have Kampala and Entebbe. Entebbe was the historical uh, colonial um capital of Uganda, that's where you fly into. And then Kampala is is uh, crazy, crazy Kampala, as some people call it. It's very busy city. Um, it's very fast. And if you're a wildlife lover and you want to go on safari, you may not even stop in Kampala. You may just go straight from Entebbe up country. And most of the, the areas that we travel to are on the left hand side of the country, the west and the southwest. Most people will go to the, the southwest, of course, to see the gorillas. So just talking through through some of the photographs, top left of the page, I don't need to tell you what that is. Uh, we have the big five. Uh, the, the elephant is one of them. And big five, as you probably know, were called that because they were the most difficult animals to hunt. 
So this is this is hunting terminology. But we also say that we have um, we have the big seven. We don't just have the big five. We have the big seven because we have the mountain gorillas and we have the chimps. They're two of our biggest draws. Um, and if you've heard of gorillas in zoos, they're not mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas can only be seen in the wild. Um, you've got various gorillas in West Africa, for example. Congo has mountain gorillas and growers gorillas. But um, here in Uganda, we um, we have the world's biggest population of mountain gorillas, actually. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Uh, Cape buffalo, very scary creature. It's it's interesting that a herd, a big herd of buffalo is actually less scary than a single but buffalo. There's a phrase we, we use of a, a wounded buffalo. He is a treacherous creature and um, often a buffalo who misbehaves gets kicked out of the herd and then he's an absolute psycho. So if you see a lone buffalo on its own, keep out of the way. You, you shouldn't be out of your vehicle anyway if you're on safari, but I, I know two people who have been attacked by buffaloes and um, they survived. They shouldn't have got out of the vehicle, but one of them is a researcher and one of them is a senior member of Uganda Wildlife Authority who was protecting some clients. So um, I'm sure you won't be in that position, but yes, he looks quite innocent chewing the card, doesn't he? But he is not. Uh, Grey crowned crane, sometimes called a crested crane in Uganda. It's, look at that, just such a beautiful bird. And it's about, I guess about four feet tall and um, very plaintive cry, but it's, it's it's one of our emblems and I'll show you that in more detail later. Again, more elephants. One of my favourite photographs in the Marabagambo Forest and Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is where I used to work. Murchison Falls, are, uh, that's a really fantastic waterfall. It is the world's most powerful waterfall. Um, and what's interesting is the Murchison Falls is about half a kilometre wide, um, and then it narrows to go through a, a piece of rock that's six or seven metres wide. So you can imagine the force as, as it powers down through that. So if you do come to Uganda, you absolutely have to go to Murchison Falls. Um, you can feel the power of the river underneath your feet. Um, of course, we have a lion, we have tree climbing lions, not just any old lions, um, and sunsets. You just can't get enough of the African sunset, can you? Some people say it's a cliche, but it's like <laughs> some things are cliche because they're so amazing that, you know, we're meant to talk about them and see them again and again and again. Uh, whitewater rafting. If you're into adventure activities, you need to go to Jinja. We call it the adrenaline capital of East Africa. And the and most of the activities are based around the Nile. Um, but Ginger, we call it the source of the Nile because you have the lake activities on the lake and you have act activities on the Nile as well. We have dammed quite a lot of the Nile, so we don't have quite as much white water as we used to have. But it's still a really fantastic experience to do grade five white water rafting. It's one of only two places in Africa where you can do that. Very safe. I've done it several times. Uh, so of, course, of course, it's very scary as well, but you're you're in the hands of experts. Um, you can also do tandem kayaking, tandem, tandem kayaking. That's really intense, actually. That's where you go through the, 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 the whitest part of the water. That's where it's really frothy and terrifically fast. Um, and you sit in the front of the kayak and behind you, you have the expert. And he does all the guiding and all the manoeuvring. So you get the both, both, both worlds. You just sit in the front doing a little bit paddling, pretending you know what you're doing and then you have the expert in the in the back who guides you and it's a really sensational experience this is this is something very different it's not on your average international tourist agenda this is a bit of stained glass window from um the the church one of the churches in namogongo if you're at all interested in history or or culture you might have heard of the namogongo martyrs um there were several dozen young men who were burnt for their belief in uh Christianity. It's um, it's a very traumatic part of Ugandan history, um, but it's very much alive and it's celebrated every year in June. And so this is um, this is this pays homage to them. And this, of course, is the shoe bill. And uh, we'll show you a close up picture of the shoe bill soon. I'm sure many of you in the chat will will have heard of the shoe bill. And if you're a birder, it may be the number one reason that you want to come here. It may be the only reason that you want to come here. And it really is a fabulous bird. This is when people, 
I don't know. I'd be very interested to know what you know about Uganda and perhaps you can say in the chat, but, you know, what have you heard about this small country? Because when I moved here, I, I knew very little. I knew the same as, as most of you, which I'd heard of Easy Armin. I'd heard of Lake Victoria and, and I knew about mountain gorillas, but I really knew my, nothing else. And so I didn't really really know what to expect. Um, and it's incredibly biodiverse country. It's very small as well, which means that you can do a lot. You see a wide variety of, of things, of scenery, of wildlife, meet different tribes, have different cultural experiences, try different food. You can have all that variety within just a you know 10 day, two week, or you know, even three week tour. This this is a photograph taken near my home. It's just it speaks to me. <gasps> You know, just feel that fresh air. This is Kibali Forest. This is one of the one of the trees in the forest. And I went there ostensibly to track the chimps, but it's you know that forest just makes you feel alive, doesn't it? And uh, I spent most of lockdown here on, on the edge of Kibali Forest, and even now I'm not tired of it. Reconnecting to nature through these immense trees. Um, okay, here we are, the shoe bill. My first sighting of the shoe bill is a bit of a cheat, really. I went to Uganda Wildlife Education Centre, a.k.a. Entebbe Zoo. Um, and you can go there as soon as if you were desperate to see a shoe bill um, and tick it off your list. You could even see it when you get off the plane. Very easy to see and very cheap to see. Um, and this guy is in the zoo. And most Ugandans won't actually go on safari. This safari is picking up as an activity in millennials. But traditionally, Ugandans would would you rather go to Mombasa or Dubai or something? Um, and so most Ugandans might have seen a shoe bill in the zoo, but went to see one in real life. Um, but I know you're more adventurous than that. So you probably want to go to Mabamba Bay, for example. And that's that's only an hour or two's drive from uh, from Entebbe. This is one of my favourite birds. Very common, actually. This is the great blue turaco. Magnificent bird. It's at least three feet long. And it's very loud um, and you get big flocks of them. Where, where I live, we've got a flock of 20 or 30 of them and you hear them fly overhead, particularly when the trees are fruiting um, and there's a bit of a battle in the tree. You've got uh, great blue taraco, which are, sorry, I don't know if you can see it on, on the screen, but it's bigger than my laptop screen. Um, and then Ross's taracos, red tailed monkeys, um, depending on the time of the day. We also see chimps as well if the figs are in fruit. Here is, here is the Uganda emblem, by the way. And here we have the Uganda cob on the left. And on the right, here we have the crested crane, the grey crowned crane. I'm sorry, I could have done slide after slide on birds, but I'm a birder, um, very amateur. Uh, we have over 1,000 birds in Uganda, which is 49% of Africa's bird species. And when you think of Africa, Uganda in the, size, in the context of Africa, um, as I say, Uganda is the size of the UK. And Uganda is a very, very small country compared to many others. But our positioning is, is what makes us... Um, attract so many birds. We've got the geography, we've got the Rift Valley, we've got Lake Victoria, we have uh, snow-capped mountains of the Renzoris, we've got the forests and the, the, the various altitudes and the multiple habitats we have um, attract this incredible biodiversity. But also um, migrating birds all pass through Uganda. If you, if you look at a map of Africa and see where birds fly when they're flying between uh, Europe and South Africa, the vast majority of them fly over Uganda. So that puts us in an incredible position. Um, and yeah, so we have 49% of Africa's bird species and 11% of the world's. And it's interesting how some people come to Uganda, British friends of mine, for example, they come here to go on safari to tick off the elephant and the cheetah and um, whatever other big animals it is. And they say to me, oh, you know what? I've never noticed birds before. Well, that's because we've got sparrows and lbbs and we don't have that many birds do we in the uk um but uh but here we have at least five times that number of birds and you can't fail to miss this fabulous great blue taraco um either by its sound or its shape or its color these are a few shots from murchison falls national park this is this was when it was particularly dry i think my mum and sister who who are watching today. Hello, mum. Hello, Sarah. 
Um, we we were on far, we were on safari with uh, with my dad, and um, we were in Murchison in January, and it was burning hot. You can see how dry it is. Um, of course, after the rains, it will all change colour, and it will be it will be very green. Um, so this this gives you a, a feeling from Murchison Falls protected area. The uh, the park itself is just over four thousand square kilometres, but it has various other reserves attached to it to make the bigger Murchison Falls conservation area. Um, it's uh, you can Roth, Roth Shields giraffes difficult to say Roth Shields giraffes um, are common there. And uh, giraffes are an interesting species because they translocate quite easily. So we're actually moving them now to Pianupe Wildlife Reserve, which is the northeast of the country. And it's going to be upgraded to a national park soon. So part of that upgrading process is we're translocating species from other animals, from other protected areas, should I say. Look at this lion, he looks very relaxed, doesn't he? Not so the Uganda cob. This is a place called Kaseni Plains in uh, in Queen Elizabeth National Park. Um, so there's a particular area of the national park where the cob congregates um, and it's a popular location for a game drive. And you can, you can often see the lions around there and you can often see leopard around there as well. And this was a really funny safari actually. Many years ago, this was about 10 years ago and I, I was still a volunteer, but I wanted to travel as much as I could. So I didn't have money for a driver. Um, and I got the bus up to, to uh, Cassese. It was about a six hour bus drive. Um, we don't have a very good public transport system, by the way, if anybody's worried, uh, thinking about using public transport. The problem that I had, and I hadn't thought about I didn't hadn't thought about it till I got to the national park. Was how was I going to do a game drive because <laughs> I didn't have a vehicle, and somebody who's paid a lot of money for a drive and a vehicle isn't going to appreciate some little volunteer saying, "Oh, can I get a ride in your vehicle, please?" So I really hadn't thought that one through, and um, I ended up getting calling a driver from the local town asking him if he'd come and take me on uh, on safari, and he turned up in this little saloon car. <laughs> And I thought, oh, oh my God, I'm not going to see anything. But actually, because he was from the local town, he knew his way around really well. Um, but I, I was literally at eye level with that lion. Um, you know, normally you're in a big car and you've got a great view and you feel a little bit secure, don't you? And um, at one point he he drove, he he sauntered past the front of the car and he was only about two metres away. And I just went, I just sunk like this, just like, OK, I hope he's not in hunting mode. Anyway, lived here to tell the tale and I uh, and write the blog. Um, here we have again, yeah, grey crowned crane. What a gorgeous creature, isn't it? Every, everything about it is so beautiful. Um, hippos. We have a lot of hippos. This is in the Ashasha River. This is in Queen Elizabeth National Park, which is in Western Uganda. Very beautiful park. It's a park of savanna. Also has forest. There we have Chambora Gorge, which is famous for its chimpanzee population. We have chimps at different places around the country. Um, the most common place to see them is Kibali Forest, which is where I live. And you have, excuse me, a very high chance of seeing them. It, it, it's not guaranteed, but I would say you've got a 98% chance of seeing the chimps in Kibali Forest, whereas other places, the chances are a bit lower. This is... This is an unusual photograph. I don't know if you can see, but the ladies are smoking pipes, which is not common. <laughs> these, these ladies are called Batwa, which are a very unusual tribe. They have, they have a rather tragic history. They were evicted from Windy um, and, and other forests where the gorillas live. Um, because if you've been if you've been to Uganda before or if you studied gorillas at all, you know that they were critically endangered. They are now only endangered. They were critically endangered. And in 1980s, uh, there was a, a count was done of the mountain gorillas and there were only 254 left living in the wild. Um, and and as I say, they don't they, they don't last in captivity. And so. Uh, the Ugandan government, under pressure from uh, international conservation NGOs, chucked out the people who were living in the forest. Um, and these people, the Batwa, had lived in the forest for 60,000 years and they lived in the forest. They, they Traditionally, they would wear skins, uh, animal skins, um, and they lived in trees. And 
they they're still around but they've been evicted from the forest and um yeah this is the only place in uganda i think where i've seen women smoking pipes i i met these ladies in a place called echuya forest you can also um they have they, they live just outside that forest um and there are various projects that you can you can take part in and, and you can meet them and you can learn about their lives so they are being taught how to cultivate but they they didn't rear animals and they didn't plant crops they used to live they used to hunt in the forest and they used to um, uh, get honey for example live off honey and it's ironic really that they 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 didn't kill gorillas but of course gorillas might accidentally have got caught in traps um and this is this is the, one of the biggest tragedies of of hunting that people might enter a national park to catch meat um for eating but they they, they lay snares that can catch elephants or giraffes or what other animals there are in that particular area this is uh the glacier on the top of uh, margarita peak which is one of no a number of peaks in the renzori mountain range the Renzori mountain range is also known as the mountains of the moon and we share it with the Congo, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. And um, it's a really fabulous part of the world. It's 150 square meters. There are 50 lakes, numerous waterfalls. Um, it's quite a hike. It's a seven day plus hike. It's not for everyone, um, but there are, but, but you can in theory, have a snowball on the equator, snowball fight on the equator. Um, and it's, so it's permanent glacier. There's, um, there's snow there throughout the year. Um, and some, some times of the year are better to, to climb than others because the lowlands have a lot of bog, although we do have uh, wooden walkways going across the, the biggest boggy areas. Um, but it's a, a no frills experience because if you do want to climb the Renzori's, you, you do camp some of the way. Um, but we do, we do have some nice sites on the way up and you can get a hot shower and you can get cooked food as well. Um, but the foothills are, are, are really gorgeous and the foothills are a really popular place to find chameleons. Um, I've even seen chameleons in, in Kampala as well, actually, um, and Queen Elizabeth National Park as well. But Ren the Renzori foothills are a place that are particularly well known for a variety of chameleon species. This is uh, a morning photo from the Haven Lodge, uh, where I always take my family when they come to visit. This is on the Nile. What's really amazing about this lodge is that it's overlooking a rapid and you have this constant shh background of water. So it's like white noise, you know, it clears your brain. Very invigorating. Um, and this was about seven o'clock in the morning. You see the wrist that the mist rising off the Nile um, and some local men in a dog out canoe fishing. Um, I, I was here just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, yeah, it's Uganda's a very interesting place because if you go to if you go to Kampala, well, if you, there's so many places you go to to like now where we have really good internet, um, but equally, oh. That's a flash there. <laughs> Famous last words. I do have internet now. We do have power with solar power, but I do also have a kerosene lamp to give a little bit light, uh, more light on me. Um, so yeah, Uganda's a very interesting country because you know, cheek by jowl, you have modern life, 4G internet, and then you have um, you know a lot of traditional life um, thriving as it has done for centuries, like these men fishing, for example. I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about where I live, um, just to give you insight into one particular area. Uh, this slide is not showing up very well. OK, I might skip to the next one. Um, this is, yeah, I'm sure you know who this lovely chap is. It's a mountain gorilla. Um, and as I said, at one point, we only had 254 in the um, in the conservation area that um, that's shared by Congo. Rwanda and Uganda, but we now have over a thousand. So their their future is is as secure as we feel it can be. When you track the gorillas, um, you are directly contributing to their their survival. Um, and of course, we've lost a huge amount of money during the pandemic, um, and that has that has just that has devastated not just the 
the tourism economy, but the economy as a whole, because tourism is the number one, was the number one revenue earner for this country. So we really would love you to come and visit us and and support the gorillas, for example. So tracking gorillas, it's um, it's not cheap. It's seven hundred dollars. But you are directly supporting the gorillas because all that money gets pumped into their conservation and they're constantly monitored. They're monitored 24 hours a day. So when you go to track them, you are almost guaranteed to see them because um, we know where they were the night before because somebody else would have tracked them. We'll have the GPS coordinates. The, the, the rangers will call uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority headquarters and they say, yep, we've seen this family. They all seem to be there. There's a, a new baby. She seems to be doing well. So um, we have a really comprehensive system for protecting the gorillas. Um, and there was a there was a, a, a big number, a big number of gorillas were born during the pandemic, actually. Um, so the gorilla population is doing is doing well, although it's um, there's constant pressure on the national parks. Um, people do still want to go into the national park to lay snares and to hunt. There's also the risk of zoonotic diseases. Um, you do have to wear a mask if you go and track the gorillas now. You actually have to wear a mask as soon as you enter the park. So if you, whether you're going to see the gorillas or the chimps, as soon as you get to the national park entrance, you have to sanitize, you have to put your mask on. And then you have to keep it on the whole time that you're in the forest. And then when, when you're actually with the animals for an hour, um, because it can take 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, sometimes three hours or more to find the gorillas. Um, once you're actually with them, you have an, a whole hour with them. And then you're asked to put on a clean mask. So we, we, we can't vaccinate the gorillas. Um, at least there's no plan to yet, as far as I'm aware. So we have to um, we have to wear masks uh, properly throughout our, the whole of our time with them. And I'm sure you're going to have a few questions about gorillas. Um, they are gorgeous creatures. I'm I like I've been, I've tracked them a number of times. And honestly, it wasn't top of my wish list when I came here. When I came here, I worked in elephant conservation, and so I was I was really amazed uh, learning about. Um, elephant poaching and hippo poaching and human wildlife conflict um, and I mean of course I went to see the gorillas but it hadn't been like that top of my list but every time I see them and I hear and I see videos of them I like I love them more and more actually they're so gentle they're huge and it's it's really unfair for them to have this King Kong label because they're, they're just gentle vegetarians um, although I wouldn't want to be charged by, by one uh, it doesn't happen very often, but um, I did see someone charged once um, and it was it was only a mock charge. It was a young sub adult just messing around, you know, like young men do a bit of bravado. Um, it's quite hilarious, actually. Um, this was this photograph here is one of my favorite favorites. Uh, first time I went gorilla tracking actually not a lot happened. I mean, you know what it's like with wildlife experiences. It can be chock a, chock -a block and you know, you can be looking in three directions at once, you know, not wanting to miss anything. But other times it's really quiet and the animals are just feeding. Um, and, and this is what it was like when I first tracked the gorillas. The animals were feeding. The, the, we did see the silverback, but he was half asleep. But the, the highlight was this uh, baby gorilla and it was high up above our head. It was, it, you know, it was uh, five metres above us and it was just twirling around and around kind of pirouetting in the air looking at me looking at me in the eye it was absolutely magic i i've i've written quite a lot about gorillas and i'll be happy to share some links with you um i've written what what it's like to have a typical day tracking the gorillas um, and the good thing is that e even though i mean mountain gorillas Yep, it's a clue. You're you're tracking the mountainous area. Um, there are lots of ways that you can you can prepare by making sure that you have the right kit, bring, getting getting a, a stick. You often get, get given a bamboo stick, for example, and using porters. Porters make everything far easier for you, and they appreciate the extra money. Um, and we always recommend that you we hire the porters because um, these in these remote areas there aren't a lot of jobs. Most people are subsistence farmers. Um, yeah, uh, and the gorilla tracking day can be a long one, but if you're not all that fit or you don't want to walk for too far, you can be allocated a gorilla family that's fairly close to the start of the gorilla tracking. So it's 
it's a fairly flexible um, wildlife tracking uh, opportunity but we also have these things called stretchers a bit of an ugly name for it it's kind of like a sedan chair a local version of it um, and I know a couple of people have used it I met an American lady who um, was uh, is disabled through a, a car crash and she so she would not have been able to see the the gorillas otherwise and she said it was absolutely wonderful to be carried up through the jungle um, and all that money goes directly to the community so they really appreciate being able to carry someone um i'm 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 very happy to take lots of questions about gorillas but i don't want to spend i, I i'm conscious of time i um, i just wanted to mention food as well so culinary tourism is really taking off um it, across africa and our food is um is generally quite heavy and quite starchy um but i do encourage you to try some of our foods we have i, I remember when i first when i first came to uganda i i been on something like an like an Atkins diet or a paleo diet for a while and um, so I was pretty anti too many carbs and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this and and the first day I had Ugandan buffet which is it's a huge lunch <laughs> and they had yam and two kinds of rice and then we had matoke which is uh, a banana a steamed banana um, and yeah, we had chapati. Oh gosh, what else did we have? We had posho, which is a maize meal. We probably had spaghetti or something like that. We had about eight different kinds of carbs. And I remember thinking, which what how am I going to choose which one to have? But I wasn't supposed to choose. I was supposed to have Irish potato, sweet potato, you know. And then, you know, vegetables are a bit of an afterthought, tiny little um <laughs> optional. A teaspoon of spinach. I mean, our, our, our raw products here are incredible. Um, avocados, this big, incredibly cheap, very, very sweet pineapples. Um, everyone, everyone in East Africa says that Ugandans uh, produce the best pineapples. So you'll be spoiled choice, spoiled for choice with the, with the fresh fruit and vegetable here. Um, but the, yeah, the, the lunches are very heavy um, and you have all these carbs, um, not a lot of, in the way of salad or vegetables, and then you have some kind of stew. I, I'm not sure if you can see this image very well at the bottom left, but this is something called lawombo, um, and it's a dish that is steamed in banana leaves. So bananas are one of our staples. We have sweet bananas, the, the tiny little, they're actually called sweet bananas, very small, very sweet, they're lovely. Um, and then the, the traditional banana that we'd have in Europe is we, we call that a bugoya. Um, we don't have those so often, but then we have this, yeah, we have this matoke and you'll see it everywhere. These bright green bananas that we harvest um, when they are um, when they're unripe and we steam them. Um, and uh, so we have matoke. And so the, the banana leaves are smoked um, and then food is wrapped in them. And it could be fish or it could be some kind of meat and uh, chopped tomatoes. It's just a, a simple sauce. And then it's steamed for a couple of hours and it's a real delicacy. Um, and it's one of the highlights of uh, one of my favourite experiences in Uganda is a place called Intanda. Um, Intanda tours have this really gorgeous, authentic, um, authentic is a word that's overused, but this really is um, uh, a gorgeous community experience um, and uh, you have to book it in advance and and the, the, the villagers came out everyone immaculately dressed in the traditional dress and then they prepared the lawombo for us um, and um, and we were invited to actually prepare this delicacy it's uh, lawombo is something that's that's, only, that's prepared for um, for a wedding for example for a special occasion because it takes longer to prepare and the ladies here are wearing their traditional dresses, the gomezi. And just a couple of fun things that I thought I'd mention about Uganda. So, uh, yeah, Uganda is on the equator and there are several uh, crossing points where you can have that obligatory selfie. Um, here we were on a family holiday, mum, dad and sister, uh, several years ago now. And you, you see a rather antiquated looking Uganda equator sign, but we're, we're very fond of it. And this this really harks back to the uh, the colonial days of the British protectorate. 
Um, it hasn't been that that sign has been there ever since. It's been painted a couple of times. There is a project to develop more facilities at the equator points in Uganda. Um, and there is going to be a drive through with a cafe and it's all going to be very bling bling and uh, there'll be activities to do there and so on. But, yeah, it's one of those things that you have to do. There are equator crossings in um on the way to Masaka in Western Uganda uh, and also in Queen Elizabeth National Park. Um, here I was posing with one of Idi Amin's old vehicles. If you're interested in history, um, there is a, there's quite a lot to see in Kampala in particular. We have, uh, we have the Buganda uh, parliament um, and the palace um, and we have the torture chamber of Amin and uh, Obote and um, yeah, it's it's a very it's an extraordinary uh, piece of history. And um, another vehicle that you'll see everywhere, uh, like it or loathe it, is the Boda Boda, and um, it's it's our quickest way to get around. Um, a Boda Boda is is basically a motorbike. They're incredibly cheap. Um, a lot of them are very unsafe, so use them with care. Use, use ones that are recommended to you by people that you know, for example. But it's all part of the Ugandan experience riding around on a motorbike. And that's it. I, uh, I've come to the end of my slides, uh, but uh, I'd love to hear your questions. I hope I didn't talk too quickly. Um, and of course, uh, everything that I've talked about, uh, I can send you links to, or you can find them on my blog. My blog is called a Diary of a Muzungu. A Mazungu is uh, from the Swahili and um, it means looking dazed and confused because apparently that's what us white people looked like when we first arrived in East Africa when we got off the boat in uh, Kenya and we were like, uh, where am I? Where do I go? I don't know the language, ETC, um, and the name has stuck. So if you come to Uganda, you will be called a Mazungu day in and day out. So um it's not a it's not a bad thing. We just look different, don't we? Um, and we are different. We we talk differently. We eat different things culturally. We're very different. But it's 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 never a bad thing to be called a Mzungu. And um, yeah, so that's my blog. It's called uh, Diary of a Mzungu. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and LinkedIn. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Charlotte. Oh, gosh, you covered so much. And uh, if I can welcome back Andy and bring in Brett, because I'm sure, for instance, Brett from Wildlife Worldwide, then you've got any wildlife questions. I'm really looking forward to quizzing Brett. Um, conscious of time, if anybody does have to go off, um, as I mentioned before as well, don't worry, we are going to be sending out a recording. So we are going to be running on for another 15 minutes or so, and we will be sending out a recording. But Charlotte, very quickly, um, you, what you haven't revealed is having uh, first visited Uganda all those years ago, working for VSO, why are you still there? What has kept you there? <laughs> what has kept me there? Oh, gosh, unending things. I, the birds, for one thing. I mean, I hadn't even left Entebbe Airport and I saw a tree full of weaver birds and you know dozens and dozens of weaver, weaver birds chattering away bright yellow set on this bright blue uh, uh, sky um and i i just i literally hadn't left the airport and i I'm thought i'm staying you know and it's just beautiful weather um and i and i say to people i said i didn't i didn't move here for the weather but it's a very good reason to stay um, because you can often go out, you know, day in, day out for week after week after week without thinking about what you're going to have to put on. You know, you don't you don't even think about putting a jacket on, let alone carrying an umbrella. Sure, sure, absolutely. And talking weather, but Andy, maybe you can pick up on this. We've had lots of people asking about when to go. What happens with the weather in Uganda? Well, the, the driest seasons uh, are generally uh, December through to February and June through to August. So naturally, when it's it's drier, it's a little bit easier, to, for example, to do uh, to do the trekking. The coldest month is usually um, uh, in July, but, you know, it's not cold. It's uh, uh, it, it's nice. But the, the, the driest months uh, are, are basically December through to February and June through to August. So. Um, whilst we encourage, you know, definitely year round, uh, year round travel, uh, it is a place where you can 
travel you know every single month of the year those are the driest uh months and and sometimes that that makes it slightly easier to uh to trek through for example but uh yeah that that will be um that will be what the uh the general recommendation would be uh to for those months yeah okay great and brett now picking up um Oh, well, lots of things to do with wildlife. <laughs> um, first of all, obviously, you you said yourself in the introduction about about gorillas, and we've heard from Charlotte about them, and you know she's now been several times, even though yep. it wasn't a, a, an, an initial interest. But can you really, really quickly? I could, to, to me, it's such a profound experience. I don't know if you can encapsulate that really, really quickly. <laughs> um yeah so i mean i i'm very privileged obviously in my role uh, i get to travel all over the world and see some pretty incredible things and come face to face with some pretty amazing species but i for me personally the gorillas has got to be i don't know in the top three things i've ever done with wildlife i mean to be able to come within you know five meters of a full-grown silverback or a female suckling her young um, I mean, it's actually giving me goosebumps now just talking about it. Um, so that sort of gives you an idea. But it really is just the most sort of emotive, powerful experience I think you can have. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, you can see similarities between them and, and ourselves makes it even more sort of um, memorable, I suppose. And it's something that really doesn't leave you. And I think once you've done one trek, to be honest, you just want to go and do another one straight away. So um, even if you're tired... Uh, if it's been a bit of a, a longer trek, then it's worth every single second and every sort of calorie burned, I suppose, is the best way to put it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it truly is it, it's a one of a kind experience and, and a life changing experience, I would probably say. Um, it, it is mm. something that should be on everybody's bucket list. Yeah. Brett, do they, do they not share 96 percent? Of our DNA, yeah, of human DNA. It's yeah, incredible. I mean, other than chimpanzees, they're one of our and bonobos. They're one of our closest living relatives. So, um, I mean, honestly, when you see the, the youngsters, particularly, I find, you know, you can literally just see a toddler sort of running around, but sort of with a bit more dexterity, perhaps. You know, they're a bit more sort of able to climb up a tree and things like that. But um, yeah, those similarities are pretty astounding, and yeah, they certainly capture your attention the moment you first see them, and sort of actually stop you in your tracks as well. I'd say. Oh, absolutely. Right. We'll come back to some privates in a moment. But Charlotte, we've had some questions about accessibility. So you did mention, for instance, about how you can be carried up um, to see the gorillas. But I was wondering, mm -hmm. A, about accessibility generally in Uganda. Um, but then go back to the gorillas as well. Somebody has asked about, you know, as a blind or partially sighted person, could you have assistance? Could you go and see the gorillas? Oh, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, well, there's no reason why you can't. I think I, I th I've heard of one blind lady who has been to track the gorillas. I mean, the thing is, you um, it's very well organised. You will have a number of rangers with you who are armed, if, if needs be, in, in case, in case um, a, a gorilla charge, which is very, very, very rare. But wherever you go in a national park, you will have an armed ranger or two or three, um, plus you will have the, 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 the porters um, and the rangers are, um, you know, they, they, they're trained in customer service and they know the gorillas intimately because they've been with them for, for months or years. Um, and you, but you may also have your own guide who travels with you in your vehicle, for example, who drives you around the country. So there, there's a, there are a number of different people there who can help you if you're blind. And I, I don't see why you can't do it. Um, but um, it would be quite demanding because uh, the paths that you use are, are, are narrow and often muddy um, and that kind of thing. So the, the tracking would, could be quite difficult, um, but, but not impossible. Um, and what were you saying about physical access? And then accessibility about... generally, if somebody has got um, obviously disabilities or, or mobility issues, um, for the country as a whole is it set up at all accessibility wise well it's it's not an easy country to move around if you have mobility issues um some of the you know some of the newer lodges might have ramps for example but they are in most most places honestly won't or they will have it at the front of the property 
but not everywhere. Um, it's it's something that we're really behind the curve on, honestly. Um, so that there are a few places, but you would you'd have a limited choice, I think, in terms of where you stayed realistically. Okay, no, it's better to be honest about these things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know, um, Brett or Andy, if you've got anything to add to that, but um... I, I would just say from my experience, um, you know, Africa as a whole. <laughs> isn't uh, particularly well geared for for accessibility um and it is just one of the challenges of, of the safari sector uh, in general i would say I, from, from my view i would totally totally agree I, uh, a few of the uh higher end safari lodges are more and more you know adding more accessible rooms for example but in general the the experiences and the activities you know it's a it's a challenge that um that everybody needs to um uh, to you know help with uh, moving forward yeah, no, sure, sure, no, absolutely. Um, all right, Brett, obviously we talked a bit about gorillas, but we haven't talked about chimpanzees much or even other yep. primates. Now, one of the joys of Uganda, of course, is that you are pretty much guaranteed to see chimpanzees mm. if you do want to go and see them. Yeah. Um, so how, how is that experience different? Um, well, in terms of sort of the landscape's very different, I think, is one of the, the most important things to say. Um, the mountain gorillas, as their name suggests, are quite literally up a mountain. Um, so Bwindi and Penetrable Forest is sort of, I guess, the iconic gorilla trekking uh, spot. Um, and it can be very steep, um, whereas the chimps, for the most part, live in sort of a, a more of a rolling hill landscape, a much flatter uh, environment, sort of, um, you know, rainforest style environment. Um, you can get them at Chaimbura Gorge as well. Uh, I saw some there. Um, it's quite a small population. It's quite a different experience to um, Kavali, where um, Charlotte lives. So it's it's quite a different sort of setup. Um, I would say if you really wanted to see chimps, then going up to Jabali is probably a, a better option, to be honest. Um, much better success rate and uh, and sort of similar in terms of the gorillas. You get to spend uh, about an hour with the the chimps when you find the family um and it's an equally emotive experience um but i would just say chimpanzees as a whole are a little more mobile is probably the best way to put it than the gorillas <laughs> from my experience so normally when you find the gorillas they're sort of sat pretty still quite sedentary um enjoying the the lush vegetation whereas the chimps can quite quickly decide they're going to be on the move um and when they move <laughs> they really can move um so you just got to be aware of that but it, it's it's an incredible wildlife experience as well um and i think if you if nobody had ever done the gorillas then seeing the chimps would probably be the most incredible life-changing experience as well um so it, it's definitely again a top top wildlife experience and, and something that if you have the opportunity i would not hesitate to to, to do it that's for sure i think i think I think you have to do both. Sorry to interrupt, Lynn, because they are they are vastly different experiences. Yeah. Actually, uh, the chimps are they're they're nuts. They're, they're you know they're 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 us at our craziest. You know they really really wear their hearts on their sleeves, and you hear them screaming at each other, and you think they're ripping each other apart. And what it is is somebody's seen a bigger fig than the other person has, and they're all trying to go for it at the same time. So they are absolute drama queens, but, uh, but, they're, but they're hilarious and they're absolutely fascinating because they are, you know, a, a couple of, um, they are 98.7% the same as us. I think that's it. Um, so there's so many similarities. It's, it's really, you know, you see people you know when you look at them in, in the way that they move, their facial expressions and so on. So, um, I, I'm really fascinated by chimps, actually. Oh, wonderful. Sounds like a soap opera. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's always a different uh, saga going on. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. So, Brett, when, um, when you get asked by clients about, you know, safari experiences, how would you, in a nutshell, compare um, Uganda to other places in Africa? Um, I think personally, it's really, really different. So I do quite a lot in, in East Africa. Um, I specialize in Kenya and Tanzania. And then I used to live and work in Zambia, obviously. Um, and so for me, it is very different, partly because of the diversity that you find in Uganda. Uganda is an incredibly diverse country. 
Um, and each national park has its completely own, you know, characteristics, its own, their own feel. Um, and so it depends what your interests are. So a typical thing that people like to do, for example, as Charlotte sort of mentioned, is combining the gorillas and the chimps. That's a really great thing to do. But then I would also really highly recommend, you know, you head to like the Ashasha sector in Queen Elizabeth National Park to see the tree climbing lions. Um, there aren't many places in Africa you can see tree climbing lions. So that's pretty fantastic. You'll also see um, endemic uh, antelope such as the Ugandan cob. Um, and then, you know, Murchison Falls is another fantastic place, another brilliant national park. And um, the Rhino Sanctuary Ziwa is fantastic as well. Um, you know, and then in the south is Lake Mburu and up in the northeast, way, way away is Kadepo. Um, so there's so many different sort of experiences and encounters you can have with a really wide range of species. And if you're a birder, as we've talked about, I mean, the, the diversity is absolutely remarkable because you've sort of got this amalgamation of, of different habitats. But you've also got all the different sort of regions. You've got East Africa, you've got the Congo, you've got a central southern Africa. Um, and then, you, you know, to the north, you've got Sudan and things like that. So there really is such an incredible diversity. Um, and I would say for the birders, the shoe bill is probably the standout. Um, and actually, you don't even have to go far from Entebbe to see them. So, um, you know, it's not all about huge distances and, and trekking to the remotest parts or anything like that. So sometimes the best sightings are, are actually relatively accessible. Yeah. Well, brilliant. And we'll have to get some of those places that you mentioned into the 5B now because uh, that sounds yep. terrific. Uh, and you mentioned Kadepo, and um, Charlotte, would you recommend Kadepo Valley uh, to visit? I confess I haven't been there. It's the only okay. national park I haven't visited yet. Um, and But everyone who goes there says it's their favourite national park in the country. It's, it's vast, hardly anyone goes there, so it's unspoiled, um, has huge herds of buffalo, um, it's, it's it's known to have had herds of over a thousand head of buffalo um, and cheetah. It's the only national park in Uganda where you can see cheetah. You can see secretary bird. Um, there are birds there that, you, you, that are endemic to that area that you don't see in other parts of the country as well. Um, and it, but it is um, it, it is a long way from the other tourist areas of the country. So you've got you're going to spend a day getting there and a day getting back. Um, most likely, although you can fly as well. Um, if, if money's not an option, you can fly there too. That's another 300 or so dollars each way. Um, but yes, Kidepo is, is definitely one to watch. Um, and if you are up there for wildlife, you could then go to Karamoja and visit some of the tribes there. It's a very undeveloped part of the country where we have some fabulous tribes we we use one of the photographs in the promotional materials um everybody wears very bright colored um t-shirts and beads um and and, and skirts or, or trousers like every day of the week this isn't just for, for for tourists or special occasions they they're always very colorful um so yes that's that's that part, that part of the corner kidepo and karamoja is, is definitely coming up and, and one to watch over the next few years Okay, brilliant. That sounds, that sounds really intriguing. Uh, Andy, sorry to come to you with, if you like, the boring questions, but a couple, <laughs> of, people, right. <laughs> a couple of people have asked about <laughs> COVID tests and oh, all that sort of thing. What's the yes. current situation? So sadly, um, not just for Uganda, but for every, every everywhere in uh, uh, the planet, you know, sadly, we still have to think about it. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, for those that couldn't join at the beginning, at the moment we still require, or Uganda requires rather, uh, a PCR test within 72 hours uh, on arrival. Um, on the ground, um, the restrictions have, have been uh, eased over the last few months. Uh, at the beginning of the year, for example, there was uh, still a curfew um, uh, in, in Uganda, but that's all uh, been removed by, by the government. Um, obviously, some properties still require other um, other measures, but that's up to themselves. The national parks, um, as uh, uh, Charlotte said, you have to wear, uh, not all of them, but uh, when you're going near the, the primates, especially you I'm have to wear a mask. And thing. So there are there are still considerations for travel, but not restrictions for travel. So it is talk. open. No, I'm, I'm uh, just, I haven't started it yet. Thanks. Oh, it's uh, it's just, I guess, like um, like any other uh, destination right now, you just have to have that extra um, layer of discussion with your experts, with with Brett and people like that, 
all of the the people on the ground will be able to tell you the 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 local and the, the latest information generally you know we are open we still require that test but um you know we are we're open for business at the moment yeah okay yeah. great good to hear um and, and can i say can i just say that in in the, the good thing about coming in on safari is you spend nearly all of your time outdoors. So uh, the chances of, of, of catching COVID and spreading COVID are very, very low. Um, we eat outside all the time. We spend nearly, you know, it's, we only sleep inside and, well, you might be camping anyway. So um, it's, a, it's a really good destination to visit to social distance. Um, and actually, overall, Uganda hasn't been that badly off with COVID. So I don't know, there's something about, I don't know if it's the way we live because we live outdoors so much um, that the country really hasn't suffered too badly. So um, it's just a bit annoying that we've got a PCR test coming through the airport. But, you know, fingers crossed that's going to change very soon. OK, um, good, good, good. And what about um, situation with malaria? Like somebody says, are antimalarial required in all regions? Can anybody answer that? Do we know? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, typically, um, we would, as a tour operator, we would recommend obviously you speak to uh, medical professionals and, and get their advice. Um, they have a pretty detailed set of maps now where they advise you uh, with the best information. But typically, I would say yes, um, anti-malarials in particularly in East Africa are usually sort of recommended. So it's worth taking that into note, uh, taking that to note. Um, but yeah, typically most of our clients, for example, would be on anti-malarials. It's obviously up to you uh, as an individual um, and, and definitely speak to your local travel clinic or, or if your GP has a travel service, then um, definitely speak to them as well. Uh, Brett, because um, some of the questions about getting around and drivers and so on. If somebody was yep. travelling with you, what, yep. what's the situation? Are they, is it a, a tailor made with a driver or um, so, how, how yeah, are they doing it? it? It completely depends on, on the trip. Um, so I run a photographic trip, for example, which I lead myself. Um, we work very closely with uh, ground operators who provide us with drivers and vehicles uh, for the safari sections. And um, what we typically do is we actually fly our clients directly from Entebbe um, over to a Bwindi, for example, um, depending on the itinerary, which way around we're going. Um, but we usually sort of fly where we can. Um, and if not, we use local guides uh, and drivers who are absolutely exceptional. Um, and for the most part, roads in Uganda are pretty good um, in some of the remote areas. Obviously, uh, particularly in the rainy season, it can become a little more uh, tricky. Um, but, yeah, we, we try and work with uh, local guides usually. Um, and if it's a tailor made trip, then obviously it's entirely down to the individual. Um, we can tailor it to suit. But we normally recommend you go with a, a guide if you're in a vehicle. Um, and if you do want to fly, um, sort of as Charlotte said, it adds cost on. Um, but it's it's definitely an easier, uh, sort of quicker way to get around, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of a, a, what we would normally do for our clients. And, and I would add as well, uh, you know, um, you can do it either way. But hiring a driver, hiring a guide is employing someone uh, and yeah. putting back into into the economy um and you know those people really do um uh, appreciate it so uh, absolutely you can do it either way but um if you you, you are hiring the locals or the, yeah. the guides or the people then you're giving back uh during your trip as well yeah i think as well like just adding to that quickly like um charlotte mentioned earlier about porters um and i think people think a porter is like someone that's just going to carry their bag around and you know sort of a bit of an <laughs> antiquated idea it's probably not the best mm. word for it from my point of view, they're just the most amazing, helpful, wonderful, charismatic people who will help you get to see the gorillas. Um, and when I say help you, I mean, if you need to be shoved from behind, then they will shove you <laughs> from behind. Um, if you need pulling up a steep slope, they will pull you up a steep slope and they will carry your bag if you want them to. I mean, you don't have to have them, but they are great support and the most amazing value for money. So although it might seem like it's a bit of a you know an extra thing to spend money on please do because it's really worth it and it supports the local people yeah absolutely. yeah i mean 
it, it's it's having a porter makes a big difference because if you are trek if you're trekking the gorillas you're supposed to have two liters of water with you because you are you you would get a lot thirstier than you think i've i've been tracking and got a really bad headache and it's because i was dehydrated and i i didn't drink as much as i was supposed to so um so yes, when you have the porter, your hands are then free to grab a stick in one hand and grab hold of a bush in another one when you get to this little muddy bit um, that you have a, a problem with. Um, and yeah, they're, they're really indispensable um, and don't cost a lot of money and, and they really appreciate the work. So definitely every time. Mm. No, I'm really glad you all made that point. I'm sad to say that we are running out of time. So just to stress to everybody again that we will be sending out a recording of the event and we will answer some of the questions in there as well and have some of the really useful links. So for instance, Andy mentioned um, some content we've got on the Wanderlust website that's really useful. Uh, we'll also, obviously we'll have links to Wildlife Worldwide and there you can do section and also to Charlotte's blog. So um, don't fret about that, that will all be in there. So I'm gonna do a couple of really quick questions, um, but then I'm gonna to come to each of you, our experts, and just ask you, it's always so difficult, I know, but one recommendation, if people had to go to one place, and this is other than gorillas, by the way, so it's got to be <laughs> other than gorillas. If they're gonna to go to one place or do experience one thing, what would you recommend? So while you're thinking about that, uh, really, really quick, um, in case of accidental illness, how accessible is medical care? Anybody want to answer that really quickly? Yes, I, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, depending what happens to you, of course, um, but you're, you're always, um, you know, there's always a, a clinic within a, a phone call away. Um, if you think you're getting something like malaria, the good thing is that um, everyone's hyper aware of it. Um, and if you get some symptoms that you think might be me malaria, you'll have three people immediately say, have you got malaria? Go and get a test um, and, and, and get the, the medication. So um, you can get tested and, and better very quickly. But um, but yeah, please, by the way, do take anti-malarials. It's not worth messing around with malaria, especially yeah. if you're only here for two weeks. Um, and but if you were to have a more serious accident, well, you, you should have travel health insurance before you come here. Uh, we recommend everyone uh, buys that in advance. Um, and we do have Medivac in emergencies if it's something more serious um, and you could be medivac to your home country or to, or to Nairobi, for example, if it was something serious. Um, but we do have we do have a good uh, system of clinics and hospitals around the country. Um, but we are still a developing country. So um, the best thing is to take your anti-malarials, get your travel insurance. Ideally, if it's your first time in Africa, have a driver guide. Don't do a self-drive um, tour as well. So, you know, minimise the risks. Don't drive yeah. at night, for example, That's because some of our roads aren't very good. Some of them yeah, have, a lot have, and a lot haven't. <laughs> okay, good to know. Um, and can one of you say, um, answer this one, do uh, most of the islands you see on Lake Victoria, are they inhabited? Some reason, truth the islands. islands. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And it's a wonderful place to see. Uh, I think the vervet monkeys are, are down there. There's different wildlife um, down there. There's actually some some lovely beaches, some accommodations that you can stay um, on the beaches uh, in, in Lake Victoria as well. So the, the sea stays are, are definitely worth um, adding into um, uh, probably the beginning or the end of your trip, usually because of the location to, to sort of Entebbe. Um, and Kampala, but um, absolutely, they're they're inhabited. I don't know if they're all inhabited. I think there's 84 islands, so I might be uh, I might be wrong with some of them. But yes, um, you can visit them, and it's it's a great thing to to add to um, to the itineraries. Oh, brilliant! Sounds like we're going to have a whole session on that. Um, okay, last <laughs> question. Uh, well, kind of probably hey, Brett. Um, best place to see giraffe and elephants. Oh, uh, <laughs> it, I mean, there are a couple of different parks. I, I suppose the typical traditional safari parks um, that people might think of it in regards to Africa would be Murchison Falls uh, and Queen Elizabeth National Park. Um, so, yeah, 
if you're, I mean, I've seen lots and lots of elephant in the Ashasha sector of Queen Elizabeth, for example, but Murchison Falls is good for, for, for both. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, either one of those two, I would say, are sort of the typical safari places where you can see those sorts of species. Um, Charlotte, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, um, Ishasha is an absolutely gorgeous place. Um, it's it's in the it's in the the southern end of Queen Elizabeth National Park. But if you're going to see the gorillas, you, you'll pass through yeah. Ishasha, and it's gorgeous, wide open savanna. And if you're lucky, you see a lion up a tree. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so glad you said about the lions up the tree. And obviously, yeah, you mentioned uh, those earlier, Brett. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, you sometimes see things. In fact, I'm going to horribly name drop Stephen Fry. <laughs> um, so I was in company once when Stephen Fry was sitting with us drinking, and he said that you never see lions up a tree. And I told him he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, brilliant. Okay, so thank you so much. I am going to come to you for that last question about what you would recommend. But um, also just a huge thank you to Brett from Wildlife Worldwide, to Andy from the Uganda Tourist Board, and to Charlotte uh, from Daria Mazunga. So thank you so much for your time tonight, guys. So very, very quickly, and you've got to be quick, I'm going to come to each of you. What is the one experience or the one place that anybody uh, on here tonight should, should go visit, should experience? So Andy, let's come to you first. Well, as it's tea time here, I'm going to go with uh, two very quick um, food and drink uh, options. I think uh, um, uh, a Rolex from uh, the street corner is always worthwhile. It, uh, rolled eggs in chapati with sort of vegetables is delicious. Uh, and then if you're out in some of the uh, some of the tribes, I can't remember exactly which tribe, but um, join in the banana beer making. You, you, you tread on the bananas. Um, it's pretty potent, by the way, so be careful. But uh, they'll show you how to make it. They'll um, they'll get you involved in in making it. So uh, try a Rolex uh, and the banana beer is my uh, recommendation. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sounds good. Sounds fun. OK, Brett. Uh, OK, I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball, I think. Um, if you I, most people usually finish their trip with something like the gorillas, for example, you know, sort of finish it with a bang but if you've got a couple of days at the end um particularly if you're finishing up in Bwindi and you're on your way back to Entebbe Kampala it's to stop at a beautiful place called Lake Mburu um there's a wonderful mm. lodge up in the hills above it called Mahingo um and it's just mm. the ultimate escape from reality I would say it's just the most beautiful place nestled away on a rocky outcrop um sit back relax look at the night sky once the sun goes down and you'll just be blown away Ooh, 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 good recommendation. Oh, <laughs> Charlotte agrees with that one. Sounds a good one. That's, and oh. you can actually you can do a horse riding safari in Mohingo. Yeah. It's, it's the only national park where you can do, do a safari on horseback. I need to be there. <laughs> <laughs> right, what am I doing next week? <laughs> and there's one to add to my bucket list. Okay, brilliant. Okay, Charlotte, what about you? Well, I'm going to recommend Murchison Falls um, for the falls themselves. Um, I've, you know, you, you hear a lot of hype about places and I was prepared to be disappointed when I got there. It blew my mind because the, the, the sound of the water and the feel of it underneath the rocks. Um, and there's a lot of interesting history behind it as well. But um, but beyond that, it's a fantastic safari destination. You have crocodiles that are four metres long. Sometimes you, you might see a spoonbill. There are over 400 bird species, including the shoebill. Um, so there's a beautiful boat ride there up and down the River Nile as well. So Murchison Falls, that's you have to go there if you're going to Uganda. Ah. Sounds wonderful. OK, well, thanks again to all three of you. That was absolutely wonderful. The time has flown so fast. It's a show we have to wrap up at that point. But uh, yeah, as I say, everybody, we will be sending out that email in the next few days. So thank you again to our great speakers and panellists tonight. And uh, thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank thanks you, for all your questions. Bye. Bye bye.